Hello and welcome back to the Cloud Church. I'm Robert Breaker, missionary evangelist to the Spanish and English speaking people. And I've got a great message for you prepared today. It's preaching on dispensations. We're going to look at the Bible dispensations. A lot of people that claim to be Christians say, oh, I, I just don't believe in dispensationalism. And they say ridiculous things like, people are saved the same in the Old Testament as the New Testament are. People in the Old Testament are saved by looking forward to the cross, and people in the New Testament are look, saved by looking backward to the cross. Just ridiculous things, and it just shows a shallow Bible teaching. They've never truly studied and learned the Bible. When I was in Honduras as a missionary, this was one of the first things I taught new converts, because this is probably one of the most important teachings outside of salvation, because you can't really understand the Bible until you see it as it is in dispensations, the way God set it up. Now, what does it mean, dispensations? That, um, well, God worked with people in different times. There were dispensations of periods of times in which God worked with a certain people in a certain way. And until you see that, you can never truly understand the Bible. And until you see that, you can be easily, easily deceived. There are many different denominations in the world today, and they all believe something different, and it's all because they pull something out of the Bible that wasn't written to them. They're trying to get under a different dispensation instead of trying to live in the dispensation that God set up for us today. One of the greatest books you can get on dispensations is this book by Clarence Larkin, The Greatest Book on Dispensational Truth in the World. By Clarence Larkin's old book, it was written in the early 1900s. But it is amazing and it's just chock full of charts and different things about what we're going to talk about today. Mr. Larkin was an amazing fellow. I believe he was, uh, worked as a, a drafter. Uh, he used to draft and draw. And because of that, the man was, was quite amazing. He was able to do a lot of things and put together an awesome book with all sorts of information. This is one of the first books I, I read after I got saved, and I could not put it down. The Bible is amazing. The Bible is a, just an amazing, amazing book. So let's look at these dispensations today. What are dispensations? Does the Bible even use the word dispensation? Well, as a matter of fact, it does. Four times in the Bible do we find the term dispensation. So dispensations are a Bible doctrine. And all these people out there that say, oh, I don't believe in dispensations, well, it's to your own peril. You need to learn the scriptures because dispensations are in the Bible. And we are going to look at those today. So let's start with the four different times we see the word dispensation in the Bible. The first time is in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. So take your King James Bible with me, if you will, and we'll look at these four different verses on dispensations. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 17, it says, For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward, but if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. Paul is talking, and he says, God's dispensed something unto me, and that's what a dispensation is. It's not just a period of time, although that's what we call it. It's God dispensing something to somebody. And God dispensed unto Paul the gospel. We're going verse by verse now um, in our verse by verse Bible study through the book of Galatians. And we saw last week how Paul says God revealed unto him the gospel. It was a gospel given to him. It was dispensed unto him for him to preach. And it's the gospel for us today. Not the same gospel as we saw in the book of Galatians, which is another gospel that's out in the future preached by an angel. So there, there are several different Gospels in the Bible. There's at least five different Gospels in the Bible. So that's why it's so important to understand dispensationalism to see where are we in the Bible and which Gospel is to us. So let's look at the second reference. This is the first reference of the word dispensation in the Bible. Now let's look at Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. People say, well, every time it uses the word dispensation, that just means dispensing something, God giving something. It's not talking about a period of time. Well, look at this, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 10. It says that the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on the earth, even in him. So God's um, talking about here a period of time connected with a dispensation. There is a dispensation of the fullness of times. So as we're going to look at correctly in the Bible, the different time periods that we call dispensations. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 2 is our third reference in which the Bible uses the term dispensation. And Ephesians 3 2 says, For you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you word. So there's a dispensation that God dispensed unto him of the, of the gospel. Paul says God dispensed unto him grace. 
But we also see there's a dispensation of the fullness of times. Now our final verse that uh, speaks about dispensations is, is Colossians chapter 1 and verse 25. These are the four occurrences in the King James Bible of the word dispensation. And since we're studying dispensations, let's look at each, each verse. Let's go to Colossians 1.25. And we read, Wherefore I am made a minister, Paul is speaking, according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery which was then hid from the ages. So there are some mysteries that were revealed unto Paul. Uh, that's a different teaching, the seven mysteries in the Bible. It's an amazing teaching. I can't wait to get to that one day. I hope we can get to that. But uh, there's dispensations in the Bible. The Bible uses the term four times. So what are these dispensations? Well, we're going to look at that. And before we do, I want to get over here to 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. So if you'll start looking up 2 Timothy 2.15, I'll go ahead and start trying to write this out up here. And uh, I'm not the best artist, so hopefully we can figure this out. We'll have over here Adam, the first man. So here's the beginning. This will be a timeline of the entire Bible. And here's the end of the Bible, so this will be eternity. Hope that shows up. Yep, barely shows up on our on our border over here. So here's the timeline of the Bible. And we're going to go through the entire Bible and we're going to look at the different dispensations or the different ways and times in which God dealt with a different group in a different way. But before we do, go to 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. 2 Timothy 2.15. And uh, if you go to the cloudchurch.org, there's an entire sermon devoted to this. I believe it's on the front page, the cloudchurch.org, and it's called Rightly Dividing and Following Paul. And in that video, I present to you how Paul is our apostle. God called Paul to be an apostle to the Gentiles. And God gave that gospel for us today to Paul, and it's what we're supposed to preach. It's how we are saved, because we certainly aren't saved by keeping the law. We're not saved by doing other things. We're saved today in this dispensation by the gospel. So 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Rightly dividing. So that's what we want to do today. We want to rightly divide. Because the Bible says rightly dividing. And how do we rightly divide? We study. So we're going to have a Bible study today, which will instruct us and teach us how to rightly divide the Bible. And by doing that, we will end up not ashamed. You see, it's a shame to me to see people say, Oh, I'm a Christian, but I don't believe in dispensations. Well, obviously you haven't studied, and you're not rightly dividing the Scripture. Because the only way to rightly divide is to study and to see there are dispensations, there are ways in which God worked with a certain group in one way, and later in a different time with different people in a different way. And by the end of this message, I hope you'll see that. I hope you understand where I'm coming from. I'm not trying to teach any new doctrine. All we're trying to do is just rightly divide the word of truth. Before we get started, let me say this also. We're in that room, so let me go up here. This is so important that people realize the Bible is written to who? Who is the Bible written to? The Bible is written to us. The Bible is given to us, but not all the Bible is for us. Now let me explain that, because the Bible is written to us. God wants us to have the Bible, but not all of the Bible is written for us. What does that mean? Well, the Bible is a book, is a book that has three different things. It's a historical book. So it's a historical book. In other words, it tells us about things that happened in the, in the past. So the Bible is a historical book. The Bible is also a prophetical book. The Bible is prophetical, which tells us about things that will happen in the future. And the Bible is also a doctrinal book. So it tells us about doctrines, and in the time, oh, I put past, I meant to put present. It tells us that in the time periods in which we live, this is our doctrine for us today. Now we can't go to a different dispensation and try to take the teachings from that dispensation and apply it to us today. It won't work. 
And that's the problem, and that's why there's so many denominations in the world today, is because they're not rightly dividing, and they're trying to get into a different dispensation than the one that God says we're in right now. So hopefully by the end of this teaching, you will understand where we're coming from. Because there are doctrinal passages in the Bible, but not all of the Bible is written to us. Some of the Bible is written to the Jews back before Jesus died. Some of the Bible is written way out here if things are going to happen way out in the future, in the millennium. So not everything in the Bible is to us, doctrinally. But what is for us are the epistles of Paul. Paul is the epistle to the Gentiles. And the doctrine for us today in the church age has to come from the epistles of Paul. That's the New Testament doctrine. So let's look at this. Rightly dividing. Well, to rightly divide the Bible, there's the most simple of all the divisions in the Bible. Let's see, I'm going to need a lot of rooms. So let, me, let me put this right here. The most simplest division in the entire Bible and you know what's so sad? A lot of people who claim to be Christians don't even get this. But the easiest division of the Bible is at the cross of Jesus Christ. That's the first way to rightly divide the word of truth. Because before Jesus Christ died, we have the Old Testament. I'm sorry, I'm thinking in Spanish, the Old Testament. Antigua. In English, it's old. And then we have the New Testament. So the first way to rightly divide the Bible is to see there is a division at the cross and it changes from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Now what causes that? Well the Bible says in the book of Hebrews where the death of a testator is, is where a testament starts. So Jesus Christ shed his blood on the cross of Calvary and that death of a testator changed from Old Testament to the New Testament. So the first most basic division in the entire Bible is there is an Old Testament and there is a New Testament. And they're not the same. They're two different things. Things that are different are not the same. The Old Testament is different from the New Testament. How you can be a Christian and not recognize that is very hard for me to understand. But there is a division that must take place as we read the Scriptures. And we need to see that everything that took place here in the Old Testament isn't for us today. We are in the New Testament. So there are two very distinct time periods, if you will. Before the cross and after the cross. Before Jesus died and after Jesus died. So why do so many denominations try to say, no, we're still back here? No, we're over here after. And it's a shame to see so many people try to put people under the law or back under before Jesus died. Let me say this also. This is important. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are what's called Gospels, the four Gospels. But Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, everything written in those books are still Old Testament until Jesus dies on the cross. So many people, they try to get their doctrine from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and yet Jesus hadn't even died yet. He doesn't die until the end of those books. And after he dies, that's what starts the New Testament. So how do people get their doctrine for today from these books when we live over here? We're not in the Old Testament. Now, I'm not saying you can't read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You should read it. There's a lot of things that Jesus said that do apply to us today. And we can take them spiritually for us. But when Jesus came, he said he came only for the lost sheep of Israel. So Jesus Christ was preaching to Jews. Are we Jews today? Well, if we're saved, we're a part of the church. And the Bible says our apostle is Paul, and so the Pauline epistles are where our doctrine comes from. It's just very important. A lot of people, they don't rightly divide. They don't even go that far and understand some things. But let me give, me, let me give you a quick example. Jesus said, if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off. If thy right hand offend thee, pluck it out. Now who here watching this video would think that that's doctrine for us today? And if it is, why haven't you cut your hand off yet? Why haven't you pulled out your eyeball yet? You see, that's Jesus teaching back here about something in the future, the gospel of the kingdom, the millennial kingdom, and in that time period when someone sins, they can be thrown straight into hell because Jesus Christ will be on the earth. So it's better if they cut their hand off rather than go and be thrown into hell. So these things back here, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, there's some great stuff in those books. I encourage you to read those books, but we need to understand that still happened in Old Testament until Jesus died. 
It's so simple to realize, okay, this is for this period. This is for that dispensation. I hope I'm not losing some of you. I've met a lot of people that claim to be Christians that say, I don't believe in dispensations. And you say, well, why? Well, I wasn't taught it at my Bible school. That's the main thing that I hear them say. Well, I was taught certain things at my Bible school. And I don't believe them because the Bible school says them. I read them in the Bible. So if the Bible says it, I believe it. I don't preach what I preach or believe what I believe because a denomination or a school or a diocese or a group tells you to believe it. I'm just trying to preach the Bible. So what does the Bible say about dispensations? What, are, what is rightly dividing? Well, first you just see there's a... I mean, it's right blatant in your face. Boom, Jesus died for our sins. He's on the cross. Before he died is Old Testament. After he died, New Testament. Go to Hebrews and find that. So let's begin with the dispensations. What are the dispensations? I've got eight different dispensations I'm going to present to you. Um, some people say there's only seven. I've seen other people say there's nine or there's eleven dispensations. I, you can make as many different dispensations as you want, but dispensational teaching is a, is a teaching to kind of show this is what happened during this time of the Bible. This is what happened during this is the time of the Bible. So it's, it's breaking the Bible up into different time periods to see how God dealt with certain groups of people. So the first over here, the first dispensation, we'll call it number one, is what we'll call the Edenic Dispensation. You say, what is the Edenic Dispensation? Well, Adam and Eve, in the Bible, we are told God created them and put them in Eden, the Garden of Eden. And we're going to look at a couple verses, and I'm going to try to show as many verses as I can, but there's really a lot to cover, so if, excuse me if I don't give enough verses for each one of these. But I hope this teaching will be understandable, and I want to teach a little more on this later in the verse-by-verse -verse Bible study, and also uh, present this in a little different way as well um, in various other messages. But this is just an introduction, basically, to the dispensations in the Bible. Dispensational teaching, if you will. So Galatians chapter 2, in verse 7. It says, And the Lord God formed the man out of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Verse 8, And the Lord God planted in garden a garden eastward in Eden. And what did he do? He put man in the garden of Eden. So we call this the Edenic dispensation, or the time when God made Adam and then Eve, and they lived in the garden before they fell. And it says, And there he put the man whom he had formed, and out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight, the good for, and good for food, the tree of the life, also in the midst of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And we're going to look a little bit about that, how when God made the woman, they ate of the tree. And I kind of, kind of like to draw a little tree here sometimes to remind us, in this dispensation, it was all conditioned on, don't do this. Don't do this one thing. That's what God said to Adam and Eve. There's just one thing that I don't want you to do. And that's eat of this here tree. And what's the one thing that Adam and Eve did? They disobeyed God and ate of the tree. Let's look at some more verses. Uh, Chapter 2 of Genesis and verse 15. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. 17. But the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Can you imagine? There's nothing more simple than God putting you in paradise and then just saying there's only one rule here, only one law, don't eat of the tree. Later over here we're going to see different dispensations and we're going to see one called the legal dispensation or the law that God gave to Moses. And some people say there's 1,200 to 1,500 laws that you had to follow under the law. Boy, I wouldn't, I wouldn't like to live in that time period. I would have loved to live back here where there's only one law. You can go do anything you want to do, but don't break that one law, which is eat that tree. Some people call this the, law, the age of innocence. Because Adam and Eve, they were sinless. Innocence. Oops. And so they, had, they could do whatever they want. They were true libertarians. Because they could do anything and it wasn't wrong. Except that one thing God told them not to. Don't eat of that tree. And when they ate of that tree, they lost their innocence. They were like little children. Genesis 2, 21. And the Lord God caused a deep, deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh thereof instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man, he made woman, and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones, and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. 
Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Why weren't they ashamed? Well, they weren't ashamed because they were innocent. They hadn't sinned. There was no sin in the world. Everything was conditioned on, don't eat the tree. And until they ate the tree, there was no sin. And yet sin came in because of that one sin, disobeying God and eating the tree. And it's interesting that they were not ashamed. What are we supposed to do to not be ashamed in this dispensation? Rightly divide the word of truth. So we don't want to be ashamed, as the verse says. So let's go to Genesis chapter 3. And let's read what happened. Genesis chapter 3. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said? It's interesting that when the devil shows up, the first thing he does is question God. The devil is always questioning things to make you doubt. That's called in the scientific and philosophy, uh, philosophical uh, community, that's called the Socratic method. Everyone thought Socrates was so smart. But did you know Socrates never taught anything in his entire life? All Socrates did was walk around and go, and yeah, what about that? And what about that? And what do you think about this? And all he did was ask questions. Well, that's exactly what the devil does. He shows up and asks questions. And people who follow Socrates are not very smart. Uh, they might, probably led of the devil. And God said, ye, and, and he said unto And unfortunately, that's where the video went black. And for about ten minutes, the entire ten minute period of that video is lost to history. I don't know if it happened while I was uploading it. I don't know if it happened in the editing process. But something happened in this video and 10 minutes of this teaching were completely lost. I've had people email me and telling me that and I just I felt horrible about it. And so it's been over a year ago since this video was made. So I said, well, I can either preach the whole video over, which would be great, and I probably will do that later uh, under the title of Bible Dispensations. But uh, this time I figured, well, why don't I just go ahead and, and finish that 10 minute part and go ahead and preach those 10 minutes and then get back to the video. So what I'll try to do is fill in this gap that was in this video before. And uh, yes, I look different, but I uh, tried the best I could to write up here exactly the way I had it written in that video to continue, and then we'll go back to that video to the part where it was continuing. So for all those people that have emailed me and said, please, what are you going to do about this video on dispensations? Many of them said, I wanted to learn. Well, hopefully this will fill in that missing 10-minute blank space in that video on YouTube. So I was in uh, Genesis chapter 3, and I had started reading there in chapter 3 and verse 1, how the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field in Genesis 3, and how uh, he went to the woman in question and said, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the tree, uh, the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, I'm in verse 3, God had said, ye shall not eat of it. Okay, that's what God said. But then it says, neither shall ye touch it, lest you die. Now wait a minute, God didn't say don't touch it. That shows you that in her mind, she was thinking, you know, I can't eat it, but God never said anything about don't touch it. And that showed the serpent that she had been thinking about touching it. You know, once you start touching something, it's easy to give in. So that's why you got to be careful. Well, she was thinking about touching it, and that, that was a lie. A lot of people say this was the, one of the first sins ever. Before Adam and Eve even sinned, and eating Eve sinned by lying and saying God said something he didn't say. Because he never said, neither shall you touch it. God said, you shall not eat of it, lest you die. Verse 4, And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So the devil has lied to the woman and said, oh, you won't die. Well, actually, that's a half-truth because we read in the rest of the passage that, well, she didn't die physically, but she did die spiritually. So, yes, there was a spiritual death. Her spirit died when she sinned. She lived another 900-something years. So she died spiritually when she ate. Verse 6 says, When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. 
And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And it continues there, and I don't need to read the rest of the chapter, I don't believe. You know what happened, how God uh, came and said, Adam, where are you? What happened? And Adam said, well, it's her fault. And she said, oh, it's the devil's fault. And everybody's blaming everybody else, instead of standing up and saying, yeah, I did wrong. But one thing I wanted to say about this is that every one of these dispensations that I'm going to show up here on the board, they always start out right, but they always end with evil, with man messing up. And in this first dispensation, the Edenic dispensation, it ends with man and women messing up and sinning and falling. As we get to the next dispensation and the next dispensation and the next dispensation, I show all these different dispensations, we see that that's exactly what happens. They all end up with someone doing evil or someone doing wrong. So we have to watch out for that. And as we read here in, verse, in Genesis chapter 3, we find out that God says in verse 14, And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field, upon thy belly shalt thou go, and the dust and thou shalt eat all dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. To this day, women are still scared of serpents, snakes. You go walking on a trail and a woman sees a snake, she says, Ah it's scary. Why? Because that devil, Lucifer, Satan, took the form of a serpent. And God cursed serpents, and to this day, people don't like snakes. Unless people are Satanists. I've seen some Satanists, and they, for some reason, they just love snakes. They say, oh, I love looking into their eyes. Oh, just wisdom in their eyes. Uh, maybe you're, you're worshiping the devil as your problem. That's why you like those creatures. Verse 15, and, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So there's the promise of the Bible of a coming seed, which turns out to be Jesus Christ, who will bruise his heel as he stumps on the head of the devil and bruises the head of the devil. Now verse 16 says unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception, and sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. The man is to be the head of the home. The woman is to be the help to the man. That's what the Bible teaches. And you know, if Eve had not sinned, it implies there that childbirth would not have been painful. Can you imagine how wonderful it must have been before Adam and Eve sinned? If they had produced children, and there was still innocence in the world, women would be having babies and just pop them out without any pain. Well, that would be a nice, wouldn't it? My wife's had several children. And I tell you what, it, it's a painful experience, especially when you're standing right next to her and she's grabbing your arm and you, you're like, oh, I don't feel any blood to my hand because she's squeezing so tight, but that's okay. I'm here for you, baby. It must hurt because I never felt anybody squeeze somebody's hand that hard. So yes, yes, it hurts. Why? Because that's part of the judgment of the fall. So with each one of these dispensations, they end in evil. They always fall, and that's why God has to start a new, a new dispensation. But God has to always bring his judgment upon man. So that's the uh, Edenic um, dispensation. The, is, the end of this dispensation is them sinning. And their judgment is also not only that, a woman having pain in childbirth, but being cast out of the garden. Let me read that to you real quickly in verse 13. I mean, in chapter 3, in verse 23, Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. So Adam and Eve were cast out of the garden. And God told Adam, he said, Adam, in verse 20, or excuse me, verse uh, 22, And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. So there was another tree in that garden that if Adam had been thinking, he could have run over and eaten real quick. And he would have lived forever. But he would have lived that forever as a sinner. And God didn't want that. Well, God said in other places here, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but verse 13, God says, Cursed is the ground for thy sake, and sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of your life. So, <laughs> After this sin, God says, now, judgment on you, serpent, is you're going to, you know, uh, go on the ground, you're cursed. Judgment on you, woman, Eve, 
is you're going to have pain and childbearing, and you're to submit to your husband, and he's to be the king of the house. You're supposed to submit to him. Judgment to you, Adam, is you have to leave the garden, you and Eve. And you'll have to, and as the, the, the verse says here, by the sweat of your brow, you're going to have to live. Um, don't remember what, there it is, verse 19. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For it, of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and dust thou shalt return. So, we lost a lot when Adam and Eve sinned. Mankind lost a lot. Women the most, because she could have had childbearing without pain. And now men have to till the ground. And by the sweat of their brow, the sweat of their face, they have to work for their food. No more just walking around in the Garden of Eden and just pulling off a fruit when you're hungry. Now you have to work hard and plant vegetables and work to live. So that's the first dispensation. That's the Edenic dispensation. The next dispensation is the dispensation that we call the Antediluvial Dispensation. And in the Antediluvial Dispensation, number two... This is the dispensation of what happens from Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve had some children. And what happens during this time after Adam and Eve and their children. This, let's go to Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2 talks about this a little bit. And in Romans chapter 2 we, we read about this time period. It was an interesting time period. A very strange time period because men were still living by their conscience. And I must remind you that there was no law yet. The law of Moses had not come. We're going to look at the law, the dispensation of the law of Moses later. So this is this dispensation that starts with the children of Adam and Eve and ends with the flood. Remember, every time that they have a dispensation, that God sets up a dispensation, it always ends in evil. And God's judgment always has to come. So Romans chapter 2 and verse 12 through 15 tells us that in this time period, the way that God dealt with man is he was literally come to man and speak to man. And he told men that you're going to live and you're going to do right and men had to follow their conscience. And it was the time in which men lived before the law. So in Romans chapter 2 verses 12 through 15 we read, For as many as have sinned without law shall also perish without law. And as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. Now, verse 14. Now, when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, well, that's here, before the law, Gentiles, they were all Gentiles, there were no Jews yet. It says, having not the law, are a law unto themselves, verse 15, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness in their thoughts, the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. So in this time period of the antediluvial age, now diluvial means flood, before the flood, these people followed their conscience. And they did what they thought was right, and they tried to do right. Unfortunately, from Adam, his sons, there were some good sons, the sons of Seth, and then there were some bad sons, the sons of Cain. There were also giants on the earth, which came from fallen angels. Um, don't have time to get into that, but get a chance to look up my, my uh, video on YouTube entitled Giants in the Bible. It's a pretty amazing study, pretty interesting. I actually show pictures of six-finger giants in that presentation. But here in Genesis chapter 6, because man started out doing right and then ended up in complete evil, God had to send judgment. Just like God sent judgment at Adam and Eve when they sinned, God sends judgment at the end of this dispensational period because of the evil of the world. So in Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, 6, and 7, it says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was very great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made them on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repented me, repenteth me that I had made man. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So God called this one guy Noah and says, you know what? Everyone but you is evil. But I want to save you. Not only did he save Noah, he saved his wife, his three kids, and their three wives. Eight people went on the ark. And this flood came... And the judgment upon the world was the flood in which God literally killed everyone but, Adam, but Noah and his family. 
So each dispensation, as we go through this, we see that it starts out good, but always ends in man messing up, and man falling, and man becoming evil and doing wrong. Well, now let's look at the, uh, the next one. This is what we call number three of human, the dispensation of human government. After the flood, Noah's children began to produce children that began to produce children that began to produce children. And uh, this leads, well, one of Noah's sons was Shem. And from Shem, we have a man named Nimrod. Nimrod, the Bible calls the mighty hunter. By the way, this is the uh, post-diluvial dispensation. I wrote human government over here. I should have wrote it like this. The post-diluvial. Diluvial. So the after the flood. So this is the dispensation of human government, the post-diluvial flood, in which we have the Tower of Babel. I don't know if you've ever heard of the Tower of Babel. Some people try to say the Tower of Babel. They pronounce it differently, but if you look, this man, Nimrod, is the one that started the kingdom of Babel, and he's also started a religion in Babylon, modern-day Babylon. So, Babylon, Babel, it should be pronounced Babel. So this guy, Nimrod, which, by the way, Nimrod was the 13th from Adam. To this day, 13 is an unlucky number, they say. And this guy, he decided, well, I'm going to build this gigantic, huge tower and build it all the way up into heaven. Let me read that to you, what he decides to do. So it starts out good with Shem, but then as men begin to produce on the earth, they're so evil, they end up in evil. Again, doing wrong against God. As we go through this study, every dispensation will find that they always end up in evil, and God has to send his judgment. What was his judgment here? Well, we'll look at that. But first, let's go to Genesis chapter 10 and verse 1. Genesis chapter 10 and verse 1 says, Now these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and unto them were born sons after the flood. Now I believe from Ham is where Nimrod comes from. You've got to remember that. That's important. The good, the good line comes from Shem. As a matter of fact, from Shem, the son of Noah, is where the Hebrews or the Jews or the Israelis come from, from the line of Shem. Nimrod was an evil man, and in verse 6 through 10 it says, Now the sons of Ham, Cush, and Mizram, and Phut, and Canaan, and the sons of Cush, Seba, and Havilah, and Shebta, and Ramah, and Shabteka, and the sons of Ramah, Sheba, and Dedan. And Cush begot Nimrod. So once again, Nimrod comes from Cush, which comes from Ham, not from Shem. Shem seems to be the line that God chose to bring the Jews from, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. But this is the the ham is the lineage that the devil said, I'm going to use these people to sin against God. So it says in verse 9, He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Nimrod. Verse 8, Nimrod, he began to be a mighty one in the earth. First person in the Bible that God calls a mighty man, a big man. In verse 9 it says, He was a mighty hunter before the Lord, wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. And then it gives some other names, the name of Shinar. Well, as a matter of, matter of fact, in Daniel, it says Daniel was in the land of Shinar, and he was in captivity to Babylon. And so on and on and on there, it talks about Nimrod, and it talks about what man decided to do. And chapter 11 of Genesis shows us what, through Nimrod and these other men, they decided to do. They said, we're going to build this gigantic, huge tower up into heaven and destroy God and take over. Now, could they do it? I don't know, but that's what they wanted to do. And God didn't like that. So in Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 through 9, we read, And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and slime they had for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build a city and a tower whose top may reach into heaven. And let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad on the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. Verse 6, And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. And this they begin, they begin to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down. 
and there confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them upon the face of all the earth. So Babel, Babylon. And when someone is, is talking on and on and on, we say in English, you're babbling. <laughs> it comes from this word, from this story, from this historical record of the Bible. Babylon, babbling. Babylon, or Babel, means confusion. So once again, in this dispensational time, after the flood, man got together. And when they got together, they said, let's kick God out. They turned evil against God. So Adam and Eve, they messed up. Turned against God and did the opposite of what he told them to do. Judgment cast out of the garden. Once again, after them, man started out right but ended up evil. And were so evil, God had to put judgment in the flood. Then God started, a man started again, you know, they set up their own government. And they said, hey, we're going to all follow Nimrod. And he said, hey, let's all just get rid of God and worship me like I was God. And God goes, not again. Okay, here we go again. Time for judgment. And the judgment this time was God changing the language of the whole world to make man separate. And then I'll stop here, and we'll continue on in the video. I believe we've filled in the gap here, and I hope you'll be able to understand the rest of this video. It's an exciting, exciting video, and I believe you'll enjoy learning more about Bible dispensations. And therefore is the name of it called Babel. Because the Lord did there confound the language. So once again we see a dispensation starting out good, but then people descend into evil and wickedness, and they try to do something against God, and He has to judge them and kick them out and start a new dispensation. Well, what is the next dispensation? Well, this time, a little bit later, as we read in the Bible, God said, there's a guy named Abraham, whom I really love. And God said, I'm going to take this man Abraham, and I'm going to call out a people with this guy. We call this the patriarchal dispensation. This would be number four. Some people say it's the dispensation of family. But what we see is we see God saying, I'm going to call out a person for myself. And I'm going to use that person to build myself a great and mighty nation. And we see who that nation was and what was that was about. Let's go to Genesis chapter 17. This is so important. You say, well, that's just history that happened years ago. What does that have to do with anything today? Well, a lot, actually. Because in the world today, there's a place over there in Palestine called Israel. And Israel is in the news just about every day because there's all these Arabs that want that land, and they claim, that's our land. There's even people in America that say, free Palestine, free Palestine. Is that, is that what God wants? Is that really their land? Or could it be the other way around because the Bible says this? that that land belongs to the Jews. Let's look at this. In chapter 17 of Genesis, God is speaking to Abraham. And verse 5 says, Neither shall thy name any more be Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham, for a father of many nations have I made thee. And I will make thee exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee in their generations. Listen to this. For an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee, and to thy seed after thee. And listen to verse 8, And I will give unto thee, and to thy seed after thee, the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. From Abraham came Isaac and Jacob. And God took Jacob and changed his name to Israel. And God said, Through your seed, forever that land over there in Palestine will be yours. And you know, the Jews weren't in that land for several thousand years, and in 1948 they got their land back. Be careful saying, free Palestine. Be careful trying to say the Jews are oppressors and colonialists. No, that land, God said, is an everlasting covenant. God said, that's their land. And I gave that to them. Now we're getting a, a little... A little pressed on time, I had hoped to go through more verses, but let me, as quickly as possible, show you that this promise of God to give that land to them forever didn't just go to Abraham, but it went to his son Isaac. 
in verse 19 of Genesis 17. And God said, Sarah thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac. And I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant, and with his seed after him. So God said, forever you Jews, these people, the seed of Abraham, that's your land, Israel. He said to Isaac, my covenant is with you as well, Isaac, everlasting covenant that the land, which today people call Palestine, which we should really call Israel, because it's the land of Israel. God says it all belongs to Israel. He said that to Isaac. He also says it to Jacob. Genesis chapter 28 and verse 10. So that land over there that people are warring over and fighting over, according to God in heaven, that belongs to the Jews. Genesis chapter 28 and verse 10. You can argue with God if you want to. I wouldn't. <laughs> But in verse 10 it says, And Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. So we see in the context that it's talking to Jacob. Verse 12, Jacob, and he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and on top of it reached to heaven, and behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham thy father, and the God of Isaac, and the land whereon thou, wherein thou, whereon thou liest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south. And in thee, and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So God promised forever that land to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Israel. So whose land is that over there, the land of Palestine? According to God in the Bible, that belongs to the Jews and not the Arabs. All right, as we continue, we're looking at this. How did this dispensation end? Well, it ended up in idol worship. And through Rebecca, one of the, the, the wife of Isaac, she brought some idols out when she came out of her land. And we see eventually the children of Israel were idol worshiping. And so God took them and said, Because of your evil and turning against me, you're going to Egypt and we read that for like 400 years they were slaves in Egypt. So see the judgment again? Each dispensation starts out with God calling one person and says, I want this person to come out and do right. Over here it was Abraham, Adam and Eve had a son named Seth. And the children of Seth were the good people. So we see God taking a person and starting up a new dispensation, but it always ends up in apostasy and evil and wickedness. And God has to judge them, call out another one and start it again. And the cycle begins anew and anew and anew. So the children of Israel were slaves in Egypt. That was God's judgment because they descended into idol worship. So what did God do? Let me go ahead and erase this. God said, okay, it's time again to call out a new person, Moses. And God began what we call the legal dispensation. Number five. The legal dispensation. Or what we call the law. And what is this? Well, this is being under the law of Moses. And God took Moses as the deliverer. And the book of Exodus tells us how he took all the children of Israel and fled from Egypt. And they got their own land. They, they finally got the land that God promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They were there before, but because of their sin, they fell, and God kicked them out and put them in bondage. Then they came back into their own land. God promised it to them. It's their land. Let's go to Exodus chapter 3 and see what God says to Moses. So the cycle begins anew. God starts with one man. That dispensation continues. Always ends up with the people going the wrong way and doing evil and doing wrong and God getting so mad he has to judge them. And then after he judges them, because he loves them, he calls out another man who starts another dispensation. The cycle over and over and over. What does that tell us about us? We're sinners. That's why we need God. So uh, Exodus chapter 3 and verse 4. I'm in Exodus 4. Exodus chapter 3 and verse 4. And when the Lord God saw that he turned aside to see, God called out unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Draw not thy, not hither, not hither, but put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of the fa thy father, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. Doesn't that almost sound like Adam and Eve? They hid from God. They were ashamed. From his presence, because they knew they had done wrong. 
Anyway, and the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people, which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. And I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them out of, the, out of that land into a good land, and a large, into a land flowing with milk and honey, into a place of the Canaanites, and the Hittites, and the Amorites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. So God tells Moses, Moses, you're going to go with me, and you're going to take this people back to the land that I promised them. The Jews have gotten their land back several times in 48, here with this. And that land is theirs according to God. He promised that to Abraham. Now, when God took them out, then God gave the law to Moses. And uh, you all know the story about the Ten Commandments, and Moses going up and down the mountain with Joshua. Well, Leviticus chapter 18 and verse 5 tells us about the law. Leviticus chapter 18 in verse 5, Ye shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a man do, he shall live in them, and I am the Lord. So this legal dispensation of the law, I'll, I'll draw the Ten Commandments here. What is that? That's something that you have to live in. A person that's under the law has to do everything that the law says to do. In fact, it says you're cursed if you don't follow the law. Let's go to Galatians chapter 3 and verse 10. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 10, you're cursed. Cursed is a person that doesn't follow the law, the Bible says. Let's see if I can find the book of Galatians here for you. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 10. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. So these people are cursed, the Bible says, because they have to follow that law and do everything it says. Now do you see how different that is than over here? Where people didn't have a law and they lived by their conscience, and the Bible says they had the conscience was the law written on their hearts. But over here, God called a man, Moses, and said, Moses, here's a law that you must live under. And then eventually, they went into apostasy. Just like we've seen, they turned out evil at the end. And when Jesus Christ showed up, he showed up to the nation of Israel, in which there were religious leaders called Pharisees and Sadducees, who were evil. And Jesus says, Woe unto you, Pharisees, scribes, hypocrites. And God says, You're evil. And the Bible says that Jesus came in the temple with a whip and whipped them. What does that mean? That means the dispensation started out good, started out right with the man God called, and went into apostasy. And here came God's judgment on them again. And Jesus came. He died on the cross. They rejected their Messiah. So what happened? 70 A.D. was the destruction of Israel. And so Israel's temple was torn down. And so we see the same cycle over and over and over. God calls a man, starts a new dispensation. It ends in man falling and doing wrong. Then God calls another man, starts a new dispensation. It ends in people doing wrong. Judgment. Then God calls a man, starts a new dispensation. So up shows our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And believe it or not, He starts a new dispensation. What is the dispensation? Well, the new dispensation is what we call the church. What some people call the ecclesiastical. Uh, the ecclesiastical dispensation. Or, well, I just like to call it the church age. Or the age of grace. Because in the church, we're under grace. And so we see Jesus Christ coming. And what did Jesus do? Well, and who was Jesus, by the way? Look at John chapter 1. We read earlier in Genesis about a promised seed that God promised to, to Adam and Eve. Well, guess what? That promised seed is Jesus. He is the promised seed of Genesis 3.15. He's also called the Messiah. And guess what? That's who the Jews were waiting for, a promised Messiah. And in John chapter 1, we read about Jesus. Let's go over there real quick. John chapter 1 and verse 33. And I knew him not, but that he sent me to baptize with water. And the same said unto me, To whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same as whom which baptized with the Holy Spirit and the Holy Ghost. Excuse me. And I saw him bear record that this is the Son of God. Jesus Christ is talking about. Verse 36, Behold the Lamb of God. In verse 37, The two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus returned and saw them following, and saith unto him, Are them, What seek ye? They said unto him, Rabbi, which is to, saying, which is to say, being interpreted master, where dwellest thou? And he said unto them, Come and see. They came and saw where he dwelt and abode with him that day, for he was, was about the tenth hour. 
And one of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother Simon, and saith unto him, listen to what he says, We have found the Messiah, the Messias, the Messiah, which being interpreted is the Christ. So those early Jews, when Jesus showed up, said, We found him. We found the Christ. The Christ means the anointed one, the Messiah, the promised seed. They said, We found him, and he's Jesus. So Jesus is the promised seed. And what Jesus did is he came, he's the Son of God, the Bible says. So God, his own self, came to his own earth that he built. And he said, I'm going to start the dispensation this time. Back here, it was Adam and Eve. And then they fell. So God said, all right, Seth, we're going to start over. And then man turned evil, and God said, okay, no, we're going to start over. And man turned evil, and God said, okay, Abraham, let's start over. And Abraham's seed went evil, and because of idol worship, went it as slaves to Egypt. Egypt. So God says, okay, Moses, let's start over. You see how the cycle goes over and over and over. So then, finally, God himself got tired of it and said, I'm coming back. And Jesus Christ came, and he came born of a virgin, and he died for our sins. He paid for the sins of the entire world, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And he set up what's called the church which is also called the body of Christ. Let's look at a couple verses about that real quick. We're going long on time, but this is a good teaching here. In Colossians chapter 1, Colossians chapter 1, verse 18, it talks about the body of Christ, which is the church. That's why we call it the church age, because Jesus Christ started the ecclesiastical dispensation of the age of church. So Colossians chapter 1, Verse 16, Colossians 1, 16. For by him were all things created, speaking of Jesus Christ. So Jesus was the creator, the creator of Adam and Eve, and of all things decided to come down in the body of flesh. And it says, that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, and in him all things may have the preeminence. So Jesus Christ is also called the head. And who is he the head of? He's the head of the church. And who is the church? The church is the body. So the body is the church, and the church is the body. Well, how does this dispensation end? We could look at some more verses, but we're running a little bit long. How does this dispensation end? Well, it ends, believe it or not, in apostasy. According to the Bible, the church in the last days will become apostate. And I believe we're living in those times of apostasy. In, um, in 2 Peter 3.3, 3, it says in the last days there will be scoffers coming around saying, Oh, where's, the, where's his appearance? Where's the promise of his coming? Today, people are saying, yeah, Jesus, yeah, he said he'd come back in the rapture. Where is he? Where is he? Just like the Bible prophesies, they're scoffing. 1 Timothy 4, 1 says there will be doctrines of devils and seducing spirits that will turn people from the truth and they will depart from the faith. In, um, in uh, 1 Thessalonians, I believe it is, chapter, 2 Thessalonians, chapter 2 and verse 3, it says there will be a great falling away at the end of the church period. And that word for falling away in Greek is apostasia. So apostasy is what we see. Which interestingly enough is what happened to Israel. At the end of the dispensation of the law, all of these Pharisees, these religious leaders, were a bunch of apostates that weren't even following the law, Jesus said. So here we see the church age, and God starts it, and what happens? Just like all the other dispensations, it goes downhill. And men depart from the faith and become evil and do wrong, and so there has to be a judgment. And then the rapture. And then what happens after the rapture? Well, after the rapture, there's this tiny little time that the Bible calls the tribulation. A seven years on the earth, when after the church is taken out, God allows the Antichrist to take over. Now, why does he do that? Well, we don't have time to go into that right now. But these people who don't want God are going to stay on this earth, and they're going to have to take the mark of the beast. And they're going to think that this, this Antichrist is so great, and they're going to think, boy, he's a savior, and isn't he wonderful? At the end of this thing, God's going to come back and kick them out at Armageddon. 
And we could look at a lot of verses on that. There's just not time to, to get this all done in under an hour. So we see that, um, let me back up just a second. The rapture. If you want to look out more about the rapture, it's found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. Also, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, toward the end of that chapter, talks about the rapture. And as I backed up just a little bit, let me tell you this. Right here in the church age, we're about right there before the rapture. And for us today, God chose the plan of salvation, what he calls the gospel, is right here, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. And this is where we live. We're right here. We're not under the law. So why are there churches that are trying to put people back under the law? Romans 10, 4 says that Christ is the end of the law to everyone that believeth. So for us today, in this time period, see why dispensations are so important? We're not back here. We're not back here. We're not over here. We live here. So now that we know where we are, what is the gospel and how do we get to heaven? Well, according to this, the Apostle Paul tells us the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The gospel is that Christ died for our sins. He was buried. And He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Oops. So, here's what's so funny. I started by saying, there's people that say, oh, I don't believe in dispensations. And in the Bible, people are the same, say the same in the Old Testament as the New Testament. Really? You go to 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, it tells us the only way to be saved is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. How could someone have been saved back here that way if Jesus hadn't died yet, wasn't buried, and rose again? You see, it was different back here as compared to here. One of these days, I'll, I'll preach a message on uh, dispensational salvation. People either love that teaching or hate it. But by looking at dispensations, there is no doubt the people back here weren't saved the same way that we are today. The only way that you can say they are all saved the same is they were all saved by God's grace. And I would agree with you. God has always had grace on people to save them. Noah, the Bible says, found grace in God's eyes. Over here, we're saved by grace through faith. But then we looked at a verse that people that are under the law had to live in that, that law and do the works. So there were some works involved in the law. In old Noah, there were some works involved. Had Noah not built that boat, none of us would be here today. Well, we're not told to build a big boat. So do you see how God deals differently with different people in different time periods? It cannot be denied that dispensations show the way in which God dealt with different groups in different ways. And where we are today in the church age, God deals with us through the gospel, believing by faith in what Jesus did for us when he paid for our sins on the cross of Calvary. So, the tribulation is next, after the rapture, and it's a time period in which God allows the devil to take over. Uh, Matthew 24, 21, Jesus gives us a little bit about the great tribulation. Actually, Matthew chapter 24 talks a lot about what's going to take place in that time period. And what's the end of this dispensation here? Men taking the mark of the beast and following Satan. And because they've become so evil that they've followed the devil, well, God has to come back and execute judgment. And that's what he does on Armageddon. Let's look at a couple verses about that. When Jesus Christ comes, comes back. Because when he comes back, he starts up a new dispensation, which we call the Millennial Kingdom, or the Messianic Dispensation. And this is all written and prophesied in the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 19. But let's call this dispensation here, number 8, the last dispensation. Let's call this the Messianic Dispensation. It's the kingdom when Jesus Christ will rule for 1,000 years years. And he will rule and reign as the king on the earth. You see, the Jews didn't understand. When Jesus came as the promised seed, they thought he was going to come right then as the king, kick out the rulers of Rome, and set up his kingdom right here. But that's not what Jesus came for. The first time Jesus came, he came for the cross. He came to die for our sins. That had to happen. The next time he comes, he's coming for his crown. So the difference between the cross and the crown. So what does it say about this Armageddon when Jesus comes back? Let's go to Revelation chapter 19. 
and begin reading in verse 11. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. And his eyes were as a flame of fire, on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with the vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth forth a sharp sword, that it, with it he would smite the nations, and he should rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of the heaven, Come and gather yourselves together into the supper of the great God. That he may eat the flesh, that ye may eat the flesh of kings, and the flesh of captains, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and of them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And the beast and the false prophet were cast into the lake of fire. So, this is the dispensation that starts again, number eight. So see the difference, all the dispensations, it's the same exact cycle, over and over. Starts out right, man falls into sin, God has to judge him, and God calls another man, starts again. Falls into sin. God has to judge. Another man. Falls into sin. God has to judge. Another man. And this cycle starts over and over and over. And believe it or not, it's not any different in this one. Because after the thousand years, the Bible says the Antichrist, who was cast out back here, God's going to let him out for a season. He's going to deceive people. And then God's going to cast them into hell. We see this in Revelation chapter 20. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand, and he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. Here, when Jesus Christ defeats the devil at the battle of Armageddon, the Antichrist goes down to the bowels of the earth for a thousand years. <laughs> I wrote it in Spanish. Uh, años. Years. And then after that thousand years, what happens? And cast him in the bottom of the pit, and shut him up, that a seal... Set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he must be loosed a little season. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them, and the souls that were beheaded. And it continues, and it says, verse 7, When the thousand years were expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison, and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, Gog, and gather them together to battle, the number of whom is in the sand of the sea. And went up on the breadth of the earth, and compassed the compass of the saints, and yada, 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 and what happened? Verse 9, And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil was deceived, that deceived them was cast in the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and they shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. So you see, God always wins. And God will win in the end. And the Bible says there will be a new heaven and a new earth, and eternity will start anew here. So back here was eternity before Adam and Eve. And God said, I'm going to make this and set this up. But God knew that men were sinners, and God knew that men were always going to screw up. So always, God had a contingent plan. All right, when he does that, I'm going to call a man and start me a new dispensation with that man. And then once it goes into apostasy, once it goes downhill, once it spirals down to the worst, then I'll judge him and start again. And then judge him and start again. So it's all about Jesus Christ. And it all points to him and what he's done for us. Because men are sinners. And the only way to get rid of the sin issue is through Jesus Christ. Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. Now isn't this, isn't this teaching easy? How can someone say, I hate dispensation teachings, when it teaches us that we're sinners and we can't do right, it lays the Bible out completely from beginning to end and shows us this is how God dealt with certain people in certain groups. And it shows us where we are today. We're right here. And how to be saved today by the gospel. Why would anybody who claims to be a preacher or a teacher of the Bible not want others to learn this? Let me show you what this does. If you understand this, you cannot fall into false doctrine. There is a group out there today called the Seventh-day Adventists. And they're wrong. The Seventh-day Adventists don't rightly divide the Bible. They don't understand dispensations. So look where they want to live. Let me get a different color marker here. These Seventh-day Adventists are trying to take people and say, hey, go back to this dispensation right here. What are they trying to do? They're trying to curse people because the Bible said, Cursed are they that live under the law and don't do everything in it. When they do that, they're saying, Jesus dying on the cross doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, so we've got to go back here. They don't even get the most basic Bible doctrine of division, the Old Testament and the New Testament. 
We're not in the Old Testament, so we can't try to go put ourselves back under the law. Doesn't that teaching help you to realize, hey, I can't go back under the law. I'm over here under grace, and I get saved by the gospel. There's another group in the world today that call themselves Mormons. And what do the Mormons do? Well, let's look at the Mormons. The Mormons uh, agree that, yes, there's going to be apostasy in the church. Well, they believe that apostasy showed up in about 1800-something. And a guy named Joseph Smith came along and said, guess what? An angel showed up to me and gave me another gospel and told me to follow him. Well, the Bible says, though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel than that which you've, we've preached unto you, which is this one, let him be accursed. So why would you follow this false religious teaching, which is trying to put you in a different dispensation and try to divert you from the true gospel? Most Mormons believe in faith and works for salvation, and they try to put people back under this right there. And many Mormons try to say, oh, we're the seed now of Abraham, so we need to fall. And many Mormons try to even go even farther back. So what do Mormons do? They don't rightly divide, and they try to take two or three different dispensations and, and plug them into themselves. What about this other group called Charismatics, or Pentecostals? Well, I've been doing it in green, so let me do that. You've got Pentecostals, and you've got your Charismatics. And you know what they believe? The Pentecostals and the Charismatics believe, yeah, 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 you're saved by grace, like the Bible says, but you also got to be saved by works. And they believe you can be saved by grace, but you have to work or you can lose it. When you read the writings of Paul, it's impossible to lose salvation because God saves us. We don't save ourselves. But out here in the tribulation, it's possible that someone could lose their salvation. They could claim to be a believer in Jesus, but if they take the mark of the beast, they could lose it. So isn't that interesting that the doctrine that these Pentecostals have fits nicely in the tribulation? It's almost like they don't understand, hey, we're right here. They want to be in a different dispensation. One that's not by grace through faith alone, but one that's by faith and works, which is the tribulation. There's all these different denominations. What about this one called the Jehovah Witnesses? Even though they claim to be Christians, they're not. They don't even believe that Jesus Christ was God. But you know what the Jehovah Witnesses teach? They teach that, hey, if you'll come to God and, and follow Him, He'll let you reign in His kingdom. And they're trying to prepare for this right here, the millennium. So they don't even believe the gospel. They don't even realize we're in this dispensation. They're wanting to live in this one, and that's after the tribulation. So what does that mean? If the rapture takes place, and you're a Jehovah Witness, and you're left here, you know what you're thinking? Finally, God has come back, and they will accept the Antichrist, thinking he is God. Do you see how important it is to rightly divide the word of truth and understand the dispensations? so that you don't fall into a false religion, because all false religions have one thing in common. They don't rightly divide the dispensations. So they all try to get into a different one instead of the one that God said we're in today. So I hope this teaching has been a blessing. I've tried to make it as plain as I can. If that's plain, okay. But it clearly teaches us that we are actually in the best dispensation of all dispensations. Because we're in a day and age where we're not saved by works. We're in a day's age where we're saved by grace alone, through faith in Jesus Christ and what he did for us. This is the best time to live. So if you're saved, praise God. Why don't you go tell others about it? Why don't you preach dispensations if you're a Bible teacher or a preacher and present to your people, look at all the way God set everything up and look where we are today. Look how great it is to live today where we don't do anything. We're not saved by building a boat. <laughs> We don't have to do anything to be saved, but simply trust what Jesus did for us. It's not by works that we're saved. It's not by faith and works. It's by faith alone. What a great day and age in which to live. And this teaching just encourages me, and I hope it encourages others. It's so great to be alive today, to see the prophecy about to take place in the future, and to know, hey, it's all Jesus and what he did, and we're saved by him. How can this confuse anybody? I hear it all the time. I don't believe in dispensations because all that does is confuse people. If this is confusing, how about watching it over and see? I don't see how it's confusing because I've laid out the entire Bible and in one place and showed the different time periods and the different groups that God dealt with. I think it's probably one of the most simple teachings in the Bible.
I hope it's been a blessing to you. I could go on and on. I love talking about this stuff, but I sure hope it's been a blessing. I appreciate you watching, and we'll see you next week at thecloudchurch.org. God bless.